talking marriage. And we have been doing this marriage series very, very differently than my normal marriage series. Because usually I'm very, very practical. But I realize with all the problems in our culture and all the problems I see in the marriages, even in the church, in our church, I needed to just sort of clear it down to bare rock and sort of build a, the, the, the biblical, the New Testament church foundation of what makes a marriage work. And so I want to review the first two weeks, and then we'll go into the third week, which you'll see is, is the cap on the philosophical part of it. Today we'll be a little more practical when we get there. But we've been really philosophical on it. And the first thing we did was we talked about our identity. And we said we get our identity and value from God. And that's addressing the fact that some people go into a marriage and wanting to get their identity and their value from the, the person they're marrying. And the problem is that causes. But if you keep your identity in Christ, much better. We get our purpose and meaning from God. You don't get your purpose and meaning from your spouse or your marriage. You get your purpose and meaning from your relationship with God. And that relationships are, are intended to reflect and enhance our relationship with God. The purpose of your marriage, if you're both Christians, is for you two to become more like Jesus. And do the things that God would call you to do. That's the purpose of your marriage, okay? And we had even a a, a sort of a statement that we used, which says every relationship in our lives, every relationship, either builds us up or tears us down to the extent it reflects and enhances our relationship with God. So if it's not doing that, it's not. So that's, that's the first piece. Our identity is found in God. And then we moved on to the concept of covenant. And we, we use a quote from Tim Keller. A wedding is not so much a claim of present love as a promise of future love. So the, the, the points from that, that uh, to love, we said the love, honor, cherish, love, honor, keep, you've seen in a marriage ceremony. These are what these three words mean. To love means to provide emotional and physical intimacy, to be close to the person. To honor means to remain faithful. In other words, I'm married to this person and nobody else. And to keep means to, to, to partner together, to, to work together to become the people God designed you to be. Okay? And that's the first two foundation stones. And now we're going to move to the third one. Okay? And the third one is we're going to dig in to what Paul taught us in the New Testament about what marriage is supposed to look like. And it's important we do this because in, in Paul's day and in the old, old days, they had a really, really bad picture of marriage. And their picture of marriage was that women were property and they were to be used for the man's advantage. A man married a woman because it was advantageous for him. It met some needs in his life. And honestly, if she ever stopped meeting his needs, whatever they were, be it sometimes it was to kick, be the household manager, sometimes to provide kids, some, there were lots of reasons. If she ever stopped meeting those needs of his, he kicked her out. Now, I'd like to say we've improved, but we haven't. We've actually kind of gone backwards because would you say that that concept of the marriage exists to the husband, to, to the advantage of the husband, that's a negative? Well, what's our current picture of marriage? Well, spouses, in general, are tools we utilize for our own advantage or advancement. So it's not that we got any better, it's just we gave the women the same stupid right we gave men in marriage. Which is the purpose of my marriage. I'm not talking biblically, I'm talking about culturally. The purpose of marriage is to provide some advantages to me. I get married because makes me feel good, I like whatever, advantage to me. And if my spouse, be it the man or the woman, stops bringing me that advantage, then what do we do? We split up. Okay? And surprisingly, that doesn't work better, any better than the old version. Okay? So let's see, what is, what is the, the Christian, what is the church position on marriage? What does the, the church teach about marriage? And we start with Paul, and we're going to start with everybody's favorite verse. There's, there, in the Bible, there's, in the New Testament, there are three household codes, or hostafels if you're German. They're called hostafels, I'm serious. And they're household codes that break it down. There, there's one in Ephesians, one in Colossians, and Peter wrote one as well. And we're going to start with everybody's favorite verse about marriage. Every woman, especially all wives, most of you guys probably have this tattooed on you somewhere. Or if you're of an older school, you've got it hanging on a wall because you did, did, a, did a needlepoint or something with it. And it's Ephesians 5.22. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. And all God's people said, yeah, there's a... There's, I was expecting more joy, actually. Uh, now, you know, you know what I bet you want? I bet you want to see this in Greek. I bet you came today saying, you know, I haven't seen anything in Greek on that screen since you put it up. I would love to see something in Greek. 
So w- would you do me a favor? Put that up there in Greek. Let them, let them see the Greek, and I'm not going to pronounce it for you because I mess up pieces sometimes. It's really, I don't read Greek that well anymore. It's been 30 years since cl- Greek cl- in college. But that's 522 in Greek. Everybody see? Okay, now let me sh- show you what, what I want you to see in it. Is Go ahead and plug in the English words underneath it so we can look at it, okay? Hyguna uh, case means the wives. Tois idios means to their own. Androsan means husbands. Osto means as to. And kurio means to the Lord. Anything missing? Anything not there that you remember from the English translation? Let me read it to you again. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. What? The, 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 the word submit's not there. Steve, are you telling me this has been one of those men's conspiracy things? <laughs> that these, these, these guys have been sneaking into the Bible and inserting the word submit wherever they want it? Is that what's going on? No, it's, it's, it's nothing nefarious. It's just how a Greek language works. Um, in English, you ever heard of, you've heard of an antecedent? Every pronoun's got its antecedent, how that works? What that means is, in English, I can, once I put the noun out there, it just stays. I can say, Tom got in his car, went to the store, bought milk. Who bought milk? Tom. I didn't say Tom bought milk. I said, went to the store and bought milk. But because the noun is already established, it just stays. Okay? Matter of fact, I can keep going. I can say, Tom went to the store and bought milk. Then he went to the pharmacy and picked up his prescription and got ice cream on the way home. Who got ice cream? Tom. Because we've already placed the noun out there, and the noun stays in place until we replace it, right? And it just, it just flows that way. Well, in Greek, they can do that with verbs. In Greek, they'll take verbs, and they can say the verb in one verse, and just, it just stays until they take it away. So, what we need to do is go back and look at the verse before this, Matter of fact, let's just go look at that whole passage and see where they got this idea that the word submit should be put in there. So, so we're starting in, in chapter 5, verse 21. Submit to what? Out of reverence for Christ. Now, I have seen people who try to put this in the previous section, but the fact is you can't put it in the previous section because if you do, verse 22 doesn't have a verb. So this is the heading for all that follows. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And then we come in to here, wives, sub- submit yourselves to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is head of the wife, as Christ is head of the church. Okay, keep going a little bit. His body, of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Pause, okay? First section, what are wives supposed to do? This is easy. Submit. You guys don't like saying it, but that's what it said. Okay? Now, let's read what he says to husbands. Okay? Husbands, love... I was one part, sorry. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Oh, sorry. Gave himself up for it. To make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. Now, what are husbands supposed to do? Two things. Love your wives and give yourself up for them. How do you give yourself up for them? She said die. She said die. In case you missed it, she said die. And, and by the way, speaking of volunteers, we have an opening on the projector person. Um, just, just, so, just go ahead and apply. No. <laughs> Love and give yourself. Now, can you come up with a single word that would replace love and give yourself up for someone else? Submit. That, that's another, remember the heading of the whole section is submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Then in the, in the wife section, he doesn't even use the word submit. He says, wives, to your husbands as to the Lord. And then he comes back and says, guys, here's what it looks like for you as you're su- su- mutually submitting to each other as unto the Lord. Okay? Now, that's not what you're used to, is it? Matter of fact, if we take this, so wives, submit to your husbands as the Lord. Husbands, submit to your wives as, un- as Jesus did. 
Let's put all three of these together. We'll do this a little early, and then we'll come back to it a bunch of times. Let's take what we talked about in the first two weeks and put it together in the third week and see if we have a, a definition of, of how successful marriages work. A successful marriage occurs when we learn and live our identity in Christ. Remember, we, I, I am the image of God. That is my number one thing, okay? I then form a committed covenant with another person. I am with this person till death do us part, okay? And we mutually submit to each other for life. That's the biblical, the New Testament church definition of how a successful marriage functions. Does that make sense? Now, some of you aren't buying it yet. The whole, the whole putting the word submit on the guy's freaking you out. And there's a couple reasons you're having trouble with what we're talking about. One is you don't understand what the word submit means. Because for some of you, submit means losing at king of the hill. Right? Submit means I drop down, I do whatever they tell me to do, I cease to exist in any meaningful way. But you know what submission is? If you look at it from a New Testament Jesus perspective, submission is voluntarily placing the needs and wants of another person above your own. Voluntarily placing the needs and wants of another person above your own. It's not ceasing to exist. It's saying, that person's needs are more important to me than my own. Now, that's hard stuff, isn't it? That's harder than doormat. But that's what it's talking about. Now, some of you still going, Steve, I think, I think you're pulling something out of context. I don't think you're getting this right. Well, like I said, there are three household codes in the New Testament. What if we look at the other two and see if they're consistent in this same concept that in marriage, our job is to submit to each other. The heading in Ephesians, does it apply in Peter and in Colossians, the other two household codes. Let's go to 1 Peter first, and here's what he says to husbands. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since there heirs with you the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. First off, is this saying, play king of the hill, be the lorded over your spouse? Is that what it's saying? Kind of exactly the opposite, isn't it? What's it say? Live with her in understanding, understand her, understand her needs, understand her wants, understand her. And the weaker vessel, which means needs my help. Needs, now, by the way, again, I'll bring this up. It says weaker vessel, it's talking physically. Most men are physically bigger and stronger than women. And throughout history, there have been jerks, I mean men, who've taken advantage of that in marriage. And he's saying, don't you dare do that. Don't ever take advantage of your physical strength over your wife. But to understand her and show honor to her as the weaker vessel, understand her needs. Does that make sense? That sounds kind of like submission to me. Okay? What about Colossians 3.19? Husbands, love your wives and never treat them harshly. And by the way, just a reminder, when you see the word love in the New Testament, how do we know what love is? What did Jesus do? Okay, Jesus is our example of love. Jesus is the primary key lead example. Matter of fact, as we go through there, I don't know if you noticed, like every other time except for this one, of course, it said, as Christ loved the church, as unto the Lord. You're going to see this over and over. Watch for it as we read other verses from these household codes. It's going to comp just continue throwing it at you. As Christ loves you, as Christ loves the church. Okay? So it's that, that, that sacrificial love of Jesus Christ. And now, here's where you're also having trouble. Some of you, you're still not buying the submission thing. Because you're, 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 you're missing another piece of the word. Well, you're adding something to submission. Because for a lot of people, the idea of submission means that I put away my personality, that I become weak. Okay, that my job, if I'm submitting, that means I just turn off me, especially if I've got a leadership ability. Submitting means I don't use my leadership, I don't use my strength. But I'm going to give you this definition and then we'll, we'll, we'll this idea, and then we'll, come, we'll show you why I think it. Submitting involves maximizing my abilities and using them for the benefit of others. Submitting means maximizing my abilities and using them for the benefit of others. It would be really cool if there was a biblical example I could give you of that, wouldn't it? Let's go look for one, okay? In Philippians chapter 2, 
starts out with this. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Wow. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. It's like I read that before I did the definition of submission. Because it did. Okay? See that? Keep moving. In your... What? Relationships... What's it, can you think of any relationships? What's a relationship people have with one another? Starts with an M, rhymes with arage. <laughs> In our relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. <gasps> Could he be an example of using his potential to the full for somebody else? Who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, but... Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Now, you're going, Steve, that sounds almost like that, that um, you know, floor mat thing. No, not a bit. Because the key word is death on a cross. So why did these, Jesus die on a cross? What was the point? Was there a point? Yeah, to take the sins of us on himself. Now, what's it required to take the sins of humanity on yourself? There's two requirements to take the sins of another person onto the cross and die for another person's sins. Okay? Number one, you know what number one is? You can't have any sin of your own. We, we learn from the New Testament that the wages of sin is death. The payment for sin is death. So if you have sinned, there is a payment due. And what is that payment? Death. And that death is an eternal separation from God. Physical death, eternal separation from God. Okay? So, in order to die for the earth, first, you have to have a sinless life. Did Jesus do that? I say yes. Yes, Jesus lived a sinless life. That's a very important point. Make sure you write that down if you didn't know it already. Okay, there's a second requirement because let's say this, let's say some person managed to live a sinless life. Let's say somebody, that nobody's ever done it. Matter of fact, none of us have made it through the morning yet, have we? <laughs> right, so, but you have to live a sinless, let's say somebody did. What could they then do? They could die and pay the penalty of death for what? One person, right? Because if I'm dying for your sins, it's going to take everything I've got to, to pay the penalty of you because you're almost as screwed up as I am, right? Close, you know, it's ballpark, okay? So how can one person take the sins of humanity? Well, a normal human cannot. What's the only being in existence that could take the sins of everybody, could shoulder all those sins? They would have to be God. I don't know, you don't probably think about this. If you're talking about the greatest miracles ever accomplished, the greatest miracles ever, usually we pick the wrong ones. Like somebody might say, oh, parting of the Red Sea, that's not that big a deal. Seriously, God made water. He can part it. He can leave it flat. It's not a big deal to him. If he wants to walk on it, go for it. I think on the Mount Rushmore of miracles, there are two that I, I believe are the two biggest ones and one you've never even considered. One is when Jesus rose from the dead. Okay, when Jesus predicts, I'm going to rise from the dead, and then he does it with all the forces of evil laid against him to try to keep him from it, and he gets up out of that grave three days later. That's way up there. That's Abraham Lincoln or George Washington on the, I don't, I don't, know, I don't know which is one and which is one A, okay? The second one is when God in human flesh took the sins of every one of us and placed all that sin on his shoulders and suffered the eternal punishment that every one of us had earned. That's the other big one. Matter of fact, they happen right together, don't they? Jesus dies, that huge miracle. A few days later, he rises, that huge miracle. Who could do that? Who could possibly do that? 
God. So Jesus doesn't ignore his divinity. He lives into it. He maximizes it for the what? The benefit of those he loves. And that's submission. He takes all that he has, he maximizes his abilities, he maximizes his talents, he maximizes everything he is so that he can bring us to God. And so when we go into a relationship and we're saying we need to submit to the person, it doesn't mean turn off your strengths, it means maximize them for the benefit of the other person. Like I'm not, a, there, there's, you know, there's rumors that I can be an okay leader from time to time, Okay. It would be silly of me not to utilize my leadership ability in our home. As long as I'm doing it for the benefit of my family. Now, if I'm doing it for my own benefit, I'm using it selfishly for my own power to get them to do what I want to meet my needs and my wants, then I'm doing it wrong. But if I bring any leadership talent that I have, and I know a lot of you guys have leadership talent, and when I say submission, what you think is you turn off your leadership when you go home. No, you crank it to the max and utilize it for the benefit of the other person. That make sense? This is yes. Okay, Because submission isn't being a doormat and it isn't ignoring your strengths. It's maximizing because you're valuing their wants and needs above your own. Are you with me? Now, the, somebody throws, throws the question. Steve, um, this is all cool, but what if my spouse isn't a believer? Or what if my spouse is not very far along on the whole believer path? Or what if my spouse has walked away from God? I wonder what the proper answer is if my spouse isn't connected with God the way they're supposed to be. Well, 1 Peter chapter 3, he's going to help us out, part of that household code. In the same way, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands so that even if some disobey the word, even if they're not followers of Christ, they may be won over without a word by the way their wives live when they, when they observe your pure, reverent lives. Now, he's not saying to stick around if you're being abused. That's not what he's talking about here at all. But what he's saying is that if you want to win your spouse for Christ, look out for their wants and their needs. Take your strengths and maximize them for their benefit. And that testimony, that statement of love and, is, is incredibly powerful. And if you're in that situation, that's what you're called to do. To, what's the word again? Submit. Okay? Matter of fact, um, Andy Stanley says this. Paul, the writer of most of this stuff, essentially reduces marriage to a submission competition. A race to the back of the line. Matter of fact, though I would push it one more notch. Because I wonder, because we've been reading these three household codes, I wonder what they say about how we're supposed to treat our kids. Wonder what they say about that. Well, let, let's go look. In Colossians 3.21. Fathers, do not aggravate your children or they will become discouraged. In other words, observe your children. Serve your children, which means you're, in a very real sense, submitting to your children for what's good for them. doesn't mean you're not directing them, but it means you're doing it for their good, not your good. Like, we'll talk about ki- raising kids next week because none of you have ever disciplined a child just because they annoyed you. Yeah. Yeah. Ephesians has almost the exact same thing. Ephesians says, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up with the training and instruction of the Lord. And training and instructing, that's work that you do for another person. Right? That's the point of training and instruction, is to benefit the other person. Wonder what we're supposed to be training our kids to do. Any, any, you want to guess what we're supposed to be training our kids to do? Let's look at a couple verses. This is Ephesians 6, verses 1 and 2. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with the promise. Obey and honor. Wonder what, what, can you think of a word that would fit in there? Obey and honor, that would add up to? You guys, the first service said it a lot louder than they did the other ones too. When I said kids are supposed to submit, they're like, submit! When I said wives, they went, submit! Yeah. And another verse, Colossians version says this, basically the same thing. It says, children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases 
the Lord. And see, did I mention to you, I told you, right, how often when it comes to this attitude, he's going to point it back to Christ. He's always going to point it back to Christ. He's always going to say, oh yeah, the way Jesus did it. That's what I want you to do. I want you to act the way Jesus acted in the way that he loved others. Okay? Now, next week we'll talk a lot about more about kids, but this week we're... Let, let's, let's, let's put that, that first thing, that, that definition kind of thing. Successful marriage occurs when we learn and live our identity in Christ, we form a committed covenant with another person, and we mutually submit to each other for life. Now, let's go practical. Let's, let's, let's go rubber meets the road. Do you think this will help when we hit challenges in a marriage? Let's find out. Okay, let's, let's, let's throw a question there. What if my spouse changes? Well, A, they're going to. If you're married to the exact same person you married originally, I am hope you're enjoying your honeymoon. Because every human changes. Matter of fact, that's what we want, isn't it? We want everybody to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. And if, unless you're already exactly like Christ, then what do you got to do? Change. The words change. Your spouse is going to change. There are some areas where I'm sure Kim is ecstatically happy that I've changed. I'm sure there are areas where she's not so ecstatic about it. But how do you deal with it when your spouse changes and you realize I'm married to a different person? Okay, first off, Learn and live out our identity in Christ. What's that mean? It means you do not get your identity from your spouse. If you are getting your identity from your spouse, when they change, it challenges your identity. If your identity is because you married the hottest woman you could find and gravity and years start working, <laughs> you're going to feel your identity threatened because you don't have the same looking woman which you started with, but... That means that's a warning trigger for you that you've got your identity in the wrong place. And ladies, when your dude starts doing the things that, you know, happen. You know, in, in a marriage, I don't know if you've noticed this, first the woman gets pregnant and then the man gets pregnant and he stays that way the rest of their life. <laughs> that's just how it works, okay? And if your identity is in this person in any way, shape, or form, if they change, it challenges your identity. And that's a trigger to say, I need to recenter my identity in Christ. I am the image of Christ, and nothing that this person, nothing that any change happens in, will not challenge that in any way. Okay? Then, I remind myself I formed a committed covenant with the other person. What's that mean? It means that in front of God and everybody, I said, this one's my person. Okay, this particular set of DNA and with this social security number is mine. And as long as that one has that social security number and those, that DNA, matter of fact, even just the, because if, you know, if you go undercover and run away from the law or something and change social security number, it won't change that. This person's mine and I am committed to that person. So if they change, cool. Matter of fact, if you bring it to the next person part, Mutually submit to each other, okay? Don't get that up there yet, that's a long time away. I am to love them as they work and change. Matter of fact, I'm supposed to be, don't you get this? An agent of their change. And if they change the way I want them to change or I think they should change to become more like Christ, yay, if they change differently, I, I just got to double down. I'm not trying to say manipulate them. I'm saying I want you to be all, my job is to help my wife become all that God designed her to be. That means sometimes I encourage her, sometimes I push her, sometimes I challenge her, always I love her. Okay? And so if they change, cool. Now, this is tough, but what if we disagree about important stuff? Okay? Again, you're going to. I've heard it said, and I, I agree, if two people agree on absolutely everything, one of them's not thinking. Okay? So there are going to be times where you're going to disagree about things that matter, things that are important. And we go back to our chart. 
What about our identity in Christ? Well, some of us have an identity that says, I am supposed to make sure everybody around me thinks what I think. You either are that person or you're married to that person. Okay? Everybody's supposed to think the way I think, so when they start thinking differently than me, what does it do? It challenges my identity, which is a trigger that I've let my identity slip. I need to recenter my identity as a person made in the image of God and nothing that happens to this person or this person does changes my identity in Christ. And I got a covenant with them, which means if we disagree, we have to remember our marriage is founded on those three little words. No way out. So you got two options. You can either work it out or you can live with it. And if you can't live with it, then you got to kill him. (laughs) There's a lot of murder in this particular service. There is a lot of violence here. I don't know. No, okay. Um, You have to work it out, okay? Because... I've read the book, and, and frequently it says, don't be killing people because you disagree with them. Okay, there's, it's in there. I just, you need, yeah. And my office hours are, uh, and we have a church policy against bailing people out of jail. So, so yeah, you have to figure out how to live with it or come to an agreement of some kind. How do we do that? Mutually submit to each other. Which means when we're having an ag- a disagreement, I have to, and this is going to be hard for you guys. You got, are, you all, are, you all, are you sitting down? Are you bolted in? Seats in the upright and locked position? Submitting to the other person when you disagree means that you have to perish the thought, listen. Not, not, not wait for your turn to talk. That's not listening, okay? But, you know, taking a break so you can figure out what your next statement will be is not listening. (laughs) Listening means I am going to hear you in such a way that I understand your point. Because some of you people have a lot of trouble with this one. Sometimes when you disagree with your spouse on important issues, your spouse is right. That was an audible gasp. And sometimes they have an outstanding point that when you add it to your points, you can come up with a solution that actually works for both of you and it becomes one of those win-win situations instead of a win-lose situation. Just throw this out there as a general concept. Anytime you're having a discussion of a negative nature with your spouse, find the win-win. Because if one of you loses, you both lost. And unless, unless I'm mistaken, you didn't marry an idiot, did you? Please don't raise anybody, raise your hand. Oh, gosh. Usher, ushers, we, we need, need some, we need an escort up front here. I'm not. No, you married a person who, who, who has a brain and who thinks. And sometimes the angle they're viewing an issue in is different than your angle and it can add some depth to your position. And if you're willing to listen and you're both willing to listen and you're both willing to learn, good things can come out of that. Okay? And you have to love them enough to understand why they believe what they believe. All right, w- one more. What if I'm single? Fantastic. I'm serious. Can I, can, I just, can I just speak for Paul, the, the guy who wrote a whole chunk of the New Testament, when I say, if you're single, that's a really, really good thing? Let, let, let's, let's see what he said. Here's what he said. He said, I wish everyone were single. I'm serious. He wrote it. You can look it up. If you've got a Bible, you just put in, that, put in that reference, and you call it up, and you look in any translation, and it will say, I wish everyone were single just like I am. But God gives some the gift of marriage and to others the gift of singleness. Matter of fact, Paul says very specifically over and over again, the cool thing about being single is you don't have a spouse tying you down. He says that. Because that means you're free to spend all your time working on God's stuff. If you're married, you have to spend a whole bunch of time working on your spouse stuff, which is important and cool. But if you're not married, 
you got 100% for God. And he says, that's a really good place to be. He's not opposed to marriage, obviously, but he says, single's really, really cool. So if you're single, great. If you want to get married, that's cool. But don't feel like you have to because everybody at church asks if you're seeing somebody. You have, you have the ability to say, and this is the, you, have your, you have my permission, you have the ability to say, hey, you see anybody now? You have my permission to say, that would be none of your business. Because <laughs> if they're close enough to, to ask the question, they should already know. And if they're not close enough to already know, they're not close enough to ask. Write that down. <laughs> you nosy married people. <laughs> that was free. All right, one, one, one last thing. I want, I want to, now let's just, just, there's something that's happened here that you may or may not have seen. You probably didn't. Because marriage isn't something unique in Christianity. It's not like God came up with a whole different set of principles and said, let's apply these into marriage, and if you're not married, I've got these other set of principles. Matter of fact, marriage is like God distilled all the stuff he considered most important and placed it in one relationship. Look at this. This is what Jesus, Jesus is getting ready to go to, he's getting ready to, go to the cross. And he pulls his disciples in. I said, I got one more lesson for you. One more thing I want you to know. Before I go, there's something I need you to understand. And in John 13, 34, he says, a new command I give to you. Love one another. How? As I have loved you. You should love each other. What did we just say we're supposed to do in marriage? Love our spouse as Christ has loved us. And then he's... Before that, see what Paul did. You, you see what Paul actually did. Jesus said this. Jesus said, I want you to take everybody out there and I want you to love everybody out there the way I've loved you. And then Paul says, you know what would be a great thing to do if you're married? Take what Jesus said and distill it down and perfect it in your marriage. It's not something new and wild and wacky. It's God's standard definition of how you relate to people. Because God calls us to submit the way, take your talents and your skills and use them to benefit other people in a way that values their actions and their needs and their wants more than your own. Exact same thing. Just practice it at home where it's harder. Practice it at home where, 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 where you know their faults better. And then take that same thing you're learning in your marriage and go out and do the exact same thing. <laughs> I think that's pretty cool. When God just takes everything and ties it and puts it in a bow on it and says, you know what, I'm not give, this, is a new, this was a new commandment when he gave it. When Paul gave it for marriage, it wasn't a new commandment. It's just, here's an application of Jesus' commandment. To love each other as I've loved you. So husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Wives, submit to your husbands, love your husbands, honor your husbands the same way that Christ loves God. Children, submit to your parents as unto the Lord. Parents, submit to your children as you train them up to be the people God designed them to be. And everywhere else we go and everybody else we run into, our job is to love them the way Christ loved them. And by the way, let me, let me just clarify this a little bit more. One more piece, sorry. When Jesus said this to the disciples, what did they hear? Love as I have loved you. Well, remember, this happened the day before the, resurre- the crucifixion. So when, I don't know, Matthew heard this, he didn't go, love me the way that I loved you and went to a cross. What did Matthew hear when he said, love me as I've loved you? Matthew remembers when he's sitting in a tax collector's booth and everybody hated him. And Jesus walked up to him just like he was and loved him. He said, come with me. Simon the Zealot heard it as, I mean, I consider myself obnoxious. Can you imagine how obnoxious you have to be to get a nickname Zealot? And Jesus loved him exactly like he was. And Peter, Mr. Stick your foot in your mouth, say the wrong thing, do everything wrong all the time. 
Jesus loved him exactly like he was. And he's saying, I want you to go to every, everybody out there and love them exactly the way they are. And I want you to take that home to your spouse and love your spouse exactly the way they are and submit your abilities and talents and potential and maximize them for their benefit, for their needs and their wants. That's heavy stuff, isn't it? That's how, it, that's how it's lined up. Now, obviously, this is going to work best if I've got two people who are committed to Christ, who have that relationship with Christ. You can see that pretty clearly, right? It's not, not hiding somewhere. And if you would like to talk to somebody about having a relationship with a God who's so big and so powerful and so loving that he will submit himself to you to get you back to him. After the service, we've got a blue bags. We've got some on the corner platform here there. We've got two on the back tables. If you grab one of these blue bags, we've got people that are trained. They'll take about 10 minutes. They'll walk you through the contents of the bag and show you how to have that relationship with Christ. Now, if you've already accepted Christ, we've got, we do baptism once a month to announce, let, let you announce to everybody that you're a follower of Christ. Just let us know. We'll be glad to plug you in next baptism. Um, one way, if you want to start growing into the person God designed or being more specific about it, more deliberate about it, we have our step classes. They're every Sunday night at 6. There was, it was 7 somewhere recently. It's not supposed to be 7. It's 6. And we're doing step 1 tonight because I was out of town last week. And it'll be in the Steel Fortress Cafe right across on the other side of the tent building. And basically, it's me telling you the stories as how this church became what God wants it to be. How, who we are, why we are. I have fun just telling the stories. And you get to learn a lot about who we are and why we do what we do. That's tonight's set. You don't have to worry about signing up ahead of time. Just show up. You have kids. We've got child care available, ready. Just come drop your kids off. I, t- I take right at exactly an hour. Everybody has a good time, I think. Might be something that we talked about that you want to pray about. There's something that was brought up. We've got a cross right over in the corner. During this next song, if you want to pray about anything, you just wake, make your way over there. And, and whatever you want to talk to God. If you want to go with somebody, you can. If you want to go yourself, that's cool. Very, non, very no-judge zone. If you want to pray with somebody, we've got some people lined up around the outside of the auditorium. And if you want to pray with somebody, just go to one of them and tell them what you want to pray about. They'll pray with you about anything you want to pray about. Nobody's going to approach you about it, but if you want to approach them, you can. And we've also got communion stations. We've got one here in the front, one there in the back. And the communion station's there so you can remind yourself just how much God loves you when he submitted himself to you by going to the cross. And that's what the communion stations are for. A little reminder. You can do that during this next song if you'd like. Did I challenge you at all? Tell you what, how about I just pray for you today as we close? Father, I thank you for the example your son set. When he took our needs and placed them above his own. When he took humanity's needs and placed it above his own. Still maximizing who he was to accomplish all that you wanted to accomplish through him. And Father, as a husband, help me to live into that potential, that example. As a, as a father, help me to live into that example. Father, help us to learn the true meaning of submitting, of placing ourselves under someone for their value, using all that we are to accomplish it. And Father, I know there are people here that are challenged in their marriages, and I pray you give them encouragement. Give them, give them the drive to do what, what they need to do. Father, I know there are single people here who, who sometimes get tired of being bugged about that. Help them to feel empowered and strong in, in, in the, the station in life you have them in. And not feel like they're incomplete until somebody else shows up because, the Lord, if they have their identity in Christ, they are complete. Father, we pray that we would take the lesson we learn from marriage from you and we take it out and we live it for others. And then we would look at everybody and say, how can I submit myself to help them meet their needs and their wants and live into their potential you've placed in them? Help us to help our spouses live into their potential that you've placed in them. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.